My name is Joel. I'm one of the leaders here at Christ the King. Uh, if you're new here, we're just glad you have come today. Uh, it's been a great summer, and uh, we are kicking into this brand new series, Being Human, uh, today. So this is what's going to take us on for the next few weeks. We're in the book of Ephesians. So if you have your Bible with you, you might want to turn with me to Ephesians and chapter 6. And the title is, My Boss is a Pain in the Neck. I imagine this is a difficult sermon for people who are self-employed. Um, <laughs> Also, presumably a little bit less relevant for those of you who are uh, undergraduates or uh, those of you who are just at a stage of life where you don't have an employer. Um, I hope, nevertheless, that this is directly relevant to you, whatever your situation. And you maybe have some questions you want to ask as a result of it, which you're welcome to do. But let's get into what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9, and then we'll pray, and then I will try and explain things. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Now before I move on, let me just say slaves here. Some Bibles translate it bond servants. Uh, Whatever it is, it it shows that the people who were in the first Christian churches when the the Bible was written um, were often slaves. Many of them were. It doesn't mean that the Bible is pro-slavery. It just means that real slaves existed in the churches that the, the, the letters were written to. Bible is not pro-slavery. Some people say it is. It's because they're not reading it properly, okay? It really isn't, but it does deal with the realities and difficulties of life, and we can apply these words very much to those of us who have jobs, even if we're not slaves. Uh, With a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for this book. We thank you for your love for your people and your kindness to us in speaking to us through the pages of Scripture. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would speak to us. You take these words and apply them to our hearts so that we come to see Jesus more clearly and live for him more uh, reverently, more faithfully and more fruitfully according to your mercy. I pray for any here who feel like strangers any in any of these meetings here today or in Shoreham, or on the race course, or in the villas, Lord, that you would speak to them, that you would help them to come to know you today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, let's assume that you have a boss who is difficult. Uh, It could be a a boss who's difficult for all kinds of reasons. Maybe uh, he or she uh, is just rude to you, Uh, routinely uses uh, harsh language to speak to you. Maybe they're cruel, maybe they are over demanding, they like to give you tasks that seem demeaning to you, that are crushing to you, Uh, they like to give you uh, hard negative feedback and they seem to take delight in it. Uh, It could even be that you feel a little bit antagonized because you're a Christian, that sometimes happens, people who become Christians start to realize that their managers, their employers begin to seem, at least, to sideline them a bit. And certainly some people, because of their faith, feel a little marginalized in the workplace from time to time. It could be that it's, uh, it's not that you're being persecuted, but you're being pressurized uh, towards things that you would sooner not do. Uh, you're a Christian, and yet your employer is asking you to do things that go against your conscience. And you're, you're struggling to know what to do. You think, well, they're, they're my employer. Who am I to argue with them? I don't know what to do, and that's a, that's a difficult question. That's an example of how a boss can be a pain in the neck. It could be that they're just bad influence. You've noticed by being in your workplace, the people who are senior to you in your workplace drag you away from your principles. You've become a worse person by being around those who are senior to you. Uh, perhaps if you're a Christian, you've noticed that your employers kind of don't help you in your relationship with God, or at least they don't seem to. I hope that's not the case for people who work on the staff of the church, but anyway, uh, that, that kind of thing may be your experience. Uh, it may be that they're simply 
a massive competence gap that you just think, I, I actually don't respect my boss. I think I could do his job, her job better. And I, I, here I am slaving away for somebody who, frankly, is, is not very good at it. And uh, I, could, I could point out their flaws in detail you know, every day. Or it could just be that you clash. You know, none of the above, it's just that you clash. You just rub each other up the wrong way. You're the kind of people that irritate each other. You, 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 you cause each other to come out in, you know, in, in hives. You know, it's just, it just doesn't work. And so this is one other way. I mean, there's just many, many ways in which we could find difficulty from those who employ us, those who are senior to us in our workplace. If you are somebody who's a student or at, a, at school even, you could substitute the word lecturer or tutor or teacher. People who are senior to you in the context where you're working and your relationship with them is difficult. And the Bible's very straight about this. Relationships are difficult. They're not meant to be. Work isn't meant to be difficult. Bosses aren't meant to be difficult. God didn't create the world. So I'm going to create this wonderful world of difficulty. I'm going to make it hard on people. No, no. God made a world that was good. We are the ones who've introduced difficulty by turning away from him. And it's because of our failure to live in the good of his creation, uh, his fatherly wisdom, his kindness, his, his, his mercy and goodness to us, We've, we've deliberately decided to cut ourselves off from him. That, that has created massive problems, huge problems in our relationships with one another, uh, with, with spouses, with parents, with children, and with yeah, those who employ us. And we need to face the fact that the, the problem can be down to heart, human heart, our own heart. It could be a personal issue. The, 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 the bad news that I have to start with today is that the heart of the problem, as a friend of mine likes to put it, is the problem of the human heart. That in, in our own rejection of God and God's definition of who we are, God's fathering of our lives, in our decision to reject him, to rebel against him, even to replace him with ourselves, we've created a world of problems. And our relationships are all messed up as a result. And here in this part of the Bible, you've got uh, the writer of this letter, a man called Paul, telling people how to try and handle the work situation, how to handle the difficulties that we might have with our bosses. And I'm just going to read those first three verses again to make this point as well as I can. He says, Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. What is the one big point that comes through there clearly? It seems to me the massive point we can learn is that our boss is not ultimately our boss. Our boss actually, ultimately, that there is a boss behind bosses. There is a Lord behind the Lord. There is a king of all kings even as we've been singing just now. There's someone who is over everything, and that ought to change the way we understand our relationships with those who immediately are senior to us. There's someone in government over everything. And that means three things. Okay, let me start with the first thing. The first thing it means is that by honoring our boss, we honor God. One of the ways that we can... Honor God is by honoring those who are given us in authority. Because the, the, the Bible seems to be saying here that they're actually there by God's decision. God's put them there so that we can relate to God by honoring our employer. We can respect them, do what they say, serve them well as, as a way of expressing our devotion and our worship to the God who is over everything. And this is massive because it makes a huge difference to how we see the workplace. See, what we tend to do is we, we compartmentalize our lives into those bits of it that seem spiritual or religious and those bits that seem non-spiritual. And what we do is we say, well, Sunday when I, when I go to a church meeting, that's when I'm 
doing God stuff. When I go to work, that's when I'm kind of having to do the work because you've got to do something. To, you know, you've got to get bread on the table, so you've got to do a job. You've got to survive. But that's not really my spiritual place. My spiritual place is where I go on Sunday or wherever it is, whenever it is that you gather with Christians, you know, with other believers, with spiritual people who do spiritual things. The Bible seems to teach throughout that, that there's no such division, really. Every context we find ourselves, every place where people work is a, is a potential place of worship. We, we get to glorify God in the cubicle, in the office, at the workplace, on Monday morning, as well as on Sunday morning or Sunday evening. It's when we're in the coalface, in the reality of ordinary work, we're, we're given this incredible opportunity by honoring our master, to use that language, we are honoring the living God. It's acceptable worship. It, it's, it's something he receives as given to him. That's massive. That, that ought to change the whole way we see it. And, and throughout this book, you see heroes who, who did a great job of glorifying God by following leaders well, serving well. In fact, one of the surprising parts of the Bible uh, is in Romans chapter 13, a few pages earlier on in the New Testament, letter to the church in Rome, where the Apostle Paul is writing about people who are in authority. And you could, you could certainly throw in employers as an example of what he's referring to here. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for, listen to this, this if you're listening carefully, this will probably stick in your throat. I mean, it ought to. It doesn't really fit, certainly, with Brightonian culture. It's not, this is the least Brightonian paragraph in the Bible, I sometimes think. There is no authority except from God. Ouch. The, the idea that people who are in government have been put there to govern by God, <laughs> that does not go well with our freedom-loving mentality, where we, we're brought into a culture which... Seemed, makes it normal to simply disrespect and defy those who are in authority. The Bible is saying here, look, be careful. Every person has been, every governing person has been put there by God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Then you skip down to verse 7 where he says, Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honour to whom honour is owed. This is a difficult thing. Listen, I, I, if you don't get the difficulty of this, you're not listening. It is difficult for 21st century westernised Christians to accept what the Bible is teaching here. But it's definitely teaching here that authority, even when authority gets distorted and twisted, which it will always do in this fallen world, Authority is instituted, is put there by God. The people we give our taxes to, the people we punch in and punch out for, Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday, whatever it is that you do, they're put there in authority over us, not by chance, but by God. And if you think that's a weird thing, to say, trust me, you have no idea how weird it is. The guy that's written it here was in prison when he wrote it. He was in prison. Why? Because he'd done something bad? No, because he was telling people about Jesus. Because he was a good Christian. That's why he was in prison. You think, well, the last thing he's going to say is obey the governing authorities. They're good guys. They've all got it down. They're the, they're the guys to listen to. No, no, no. You expect him to write down... Listen, whatever you do, don't give in to the man. Don't give in to Babylon. Don't give in to the bad guy in the suit. No, Paul is saying right here, actually, you know what? The bad guy in the suit, God's kind of put him there. We kind of got to do what he says. That's weird, isn't it? Now, he's not saying, and we'll come to this in a minute, he's not saying that the bad guy in the suit always gets it right. He's not saying that the guy in the suit is, is infallible, that there's never a time to disagree but he is saying that authority is instituted by God and therefore we need to not have an attitude of recklessly throwing off those who are in authority, but actually listening, wanting to serve, wanting to abide by, because they're gifts of God to us. We honor God by honoring them. This, this book has examples of people who do that in extraordinary circumstances and, they, and God honors them for it. So we, we honor God by honoring those 
who are honouring our bosses, it also means we dishonour God when we dishonour our bosses. If we turn against them, if we exploit them, if we, if we use them, if we trash them in conversation, if we, we simply don't follow through on the tasks they've asked us to do, we might think that we're being spiritual because we come to meetings on a Sunday. We might think that we're doing spiritual things in our free time. Honestly, in our nine to five, that is when we're offering up true worship. And God says, that's not good. That's not, that's not worship from the heart. That doesn't honor me. So I'm giving you this stuff first because the Bible definitely wants us to understand that the authorities in our lives are not random. They're people that God has given us to, to follow. As we are in submission to them, we should do it wholeheartedly, reverently, knowing that, that these are people that God's given us to follow. The third thing, okay, we honor God by honoring them. We dishonor God by dishonoring them. The third thing that this tells us, and maybe the more positive and freeing and encouraging and liberating thing is this. If, if those who lead us in the workplace have been put there by God, it means that th these people in the workplace are not really pulling the strings, ultimately. That, that's, that's a huge deal. They are not the ones in control of your life. Because there's someone behind them who's really pulling the strings. There's someone behind them who has real control, real authority over everything. Uh, we need to hear this because the, the tendency we have in our relationships at work is to think that our boss is the one who's towering over us with power to, to put us into oblivion or to lift us up in promotion. Our boss is the one who has the power to make our lives happy or sad. And we, can, we can fall into that error of thinking of our boss as though he or she were the God figure in our life. They're the controlling force. They're the most important factor in whether we are going to be joyful or miserable people. And the Bible is saying, ah, that is not the case. Truly, it isn't. Your boss is not your boss. Your real boss is Jesus Christ. He's the one ultimately you'll have to stand before. And you'll actually serve your current boss better by serving the eternal boss first. And, and so... Our whole, our whole way of seeing this earthly master that we might have can be changed in a moment if we realize the freedom that that gives. We're not under, ultimately under their control. It can feel like years of our lives go by, in fact, where we have this fear that we're being held back. We're being held back, we're being controlled, we're being, we're being chained to a professional situation, a working situation, which is going to exhaust us. For some of you, you already have jobs where you feel like you've been passed over for promotion many times. And some of you, this is the thing that will come in the future. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be trying to climb the ladder and people will be fast-tracking either side of you. You'll think, what is it? What, what are you, why are you holding me back? Where is this bottleneck? What is the problem? What have I done wrong? Why are you resisting me? Why? I, I wish that you, the people who had control over my life would recognize me and lift me up, but they don't. They, they're holding me back. They're squashing me. And the problem is we've got an entirely false perspective. Not understood that the one who is in complete control is Jesus Christ. And I love the way it says in, earlier in this letter, in Ephesians chapter 1 actually, verse 22, uh, there's that verse that you can skip past really quickly. It says, He put, talking about God the Father, He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church. This is a huge verse, all right? What's it saying? It's saying so many things, but let me try and summarize the point I'm making here. It, 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 the verse is saying that the. Jesus didn't just come to rescue faithful Christians from the big, bad, mean world and take them away somewhere else where they won't get hurt by the difficult bosses and the tough workplaces and the nasty colleagues and the back, backbiting and the whispering and all the rest. Jesus is going to come and rescue you and take you away to his special place in the heavens. No, no. What Jesus has come to do is actually to have authority over every element of your life, including your boss, for you, 
For your sake. It's, it, you can, different translations of the Bible say it in different ways, and you can miss it. It's just the phrase that it has there. He gave him as head over all things to the church. Jesus is God's gift to us as head over everything, in governing everything, including every, every subatomic particle of your body and of the Pacific Ocean and of networks of galaxies that the scientists haven't even discovered yet. Jesus is head over all things. Why? What for? In the interests of whom? For the church. For his people. For, for people who know him. And, and if you know Jesus, this, this is one of the richest, sweetest comforts you could taste. To know that nothing in your life will befall you that isn't ultimately done for you. Nothing will happen to you that doesn't happen for you. God, God is planning. God is maneuvering. God is changing things. God is gradually turning things. God is engineering things. Even bits of paper that fall off desks that if the boss had seen it, it might have meant you would have got promoted quicker. Or it might have meant that your rep report would have been more positive. Or it might have been that the, the bad boss would have got sacked and, and the good boss would have come in. And All these things that make your life a misery and you think, where is God? No, the Bible says that you need to learn to trust the fact that God is sovereign over everything. The pieces of paper the stuff that goes into your report in the quarterly review, in the annual review. God is sovereign over every conversation at the water cooler, every conversation in the staff room, in the common room, every single thing that happens in existence. God is sovereignly working it together for good to those who love him, the church, those who are called according to his purpose. When you understand that, it sets you free from the fear that there's some guy in a suit controlling your destiny. And if only he would get out of the way. You realize, no, no, there's someone else controlling my destiny. In fact, he's controlling the guy in the suit. He's controlling everything. And he's for me. He loves me. He wants the best for me. Do you believe this? I tell you, this is what you need to believe. This is ultimately the best thing I can tell you. I, I don't want to just tell you this because there's some other things I want to say just now in a minute, but that's probably the most important thing for, for many of you to hear. And you need to receive it with faith. You need to do what the Bible says. Mix it with faith. Take it with trust. I know it's sometimes hard to believe. And I'll come back to that as well before I finish. But God's sovereign, even over the ones who seem to have control over us, he has a destiny in the situations professionally that just bother us and confuse us and perplex us. Don't you think about it this way? Even Jesus explains this so well. To the man who has authority over him. Do you know the story of when Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, spoke to Jesus in John's Gospel? He says to him, Don't you understand that I have the power for you to be crucified? Pontius Pilate's trying to get through. He thinks Jesus is just some mystical prophet who, who isn't really in the real world. He's like saying, Jesus, this weird Galilean guy, why, why won't he cooperate? Why won't he answer my questions properly? Why won't, why won't he just behave himself and, and settle in and come under the authority? What, what's wrong with him? Don't you understand? I could get you killed now and no one ask any questions. I could have you killed now. And it would be, the law would be on my side. You know what Jesus said to him? Jesus said, you would not have that authority if it had not been given to you. That's it. That's it. The, the, the boss who seems to have so much power, they've been put there by God. Even It says in Romans chapter 13, even as gifts to you, <laughs> as servants you could say, God uses all kinds of stuff. He can use interplanetary, he can, he can use, I don't know, cross currents in the weather. He can use anything he likes to get his plan done, including a, an apparently difficult boss. He's working a plan for you. Do not feel that you're at the mercy of things outside of your control. You are at the mercy of someone who is in perfect control all of the time. But there are some other things. I mean, you could hear all I'm saying now in the wrong way and just put it down to denial. That's all I'm saying. Just, you know, get used to it. That's a classic Christian message. Here I am, come to church to hear how to get with my boss and what I expected. The preacher's standing there saying, it's tough, get used to it. Let's sing a hymn and go home. 
I want to give you some more practical wisdom as well. There's more to it than that. Let me just draw your attention to one or two other things as well. The Bible also gives us freedom about things like where we should live and how we should work and so on. This is written, this letter in the Bible, to slaves, or this, this part of the letter is written to slaves. But there's also places in the Bible that say, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21, which, which kind of might help some of you, is talking to people even in slavery situations. And he says in verse 21 of, of uh, chapter 7, Were you a slave when called? That means when you became a Christian. Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Do you get that? If, if you were already a slave, you're, saying, Look, you're, you're free to go. You don't have to be a slave. What's the, why, why am I reading that verse to you? Because there's not many slaves in the room, I know. But, but just follow me on this. The point that's being made here is you have freedom before God to take opportunities that can be right, that, that, that aren't sinful opportunities. It's not a sin in itself to leave your job. It's not. If you think, well, you know what, I, I, I just, I need to leave this job. I can't work with this boss. This isn't going to work. And I know that I can go to this place and work, and it will work out better. That's not wrong. That's not a sin. Now, it, it might be a sin if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, <laughs> if you're trying to get away from someone who's actually a good boss, but they've called you on something and you just don't like him anymore. Or... Because you're just being flippant, because the grass is always greener on the other side. If I work for him or if I work for her, it'll be so much better. And you know what it's like. You can go for years just going from place to place to place to place, and all your bosses are rubbish, you find out, because they're all fallen human beings like you are. The problem isn't them, the problem's you. But here's the thing. Sometimes, and just sometimes, I'm putting this out there, some Christians can get into a weird situation where you have a boss who you actually... You, you, you begin to feel this weird hang-up of a burden of, I really ought to work for them because that's my destiny in life. You, you, kind of, you kind of get into this weird, I don't know, codependency or something where you, you need to be needed by this boss. Even though they treat you terribly or whatever, whatever they are, you, you, you don't necessarily even believe in what they're doing, but you, you feel, I really, I, I'm trying to use an example. The best I can think of is, is actually from Alan Partridge. You remember Lynn? Uh, and if you've never seen it before, you just have to trust me on this. But Lynn, who is Alan Partridge's assistant in the program, she's this lovely Christian lady. And Alan Partridge is a, is a nutcase, and he, she works for him. And, and, and he's, a, he's an awful, weird man. And she's, she's completely over-loyal. She's like ultra-obsessively loyal to this man who she could just leave and find a real job somewhere instead of working for this strange guy. And it's a clever kind of play on, it's an extreme version of the relationship that can come about where Christians just feel like, I really ought to work for him. But it's, it's, a, it's a terrible job and you're free to get out, you're free to find another one. Oh, but that would be a sin. Not necessarily, it wouldn't be a sin to find another job, it wouldn't be a sin to pull out and find something else. That's okay, there's freedom. Check your motives, realize that you could be going from the frying pan into the fire, but nevertheless, you're free before God to find the work that, that reflects you, that, that, that fits your gifts and skills. It's not wrong. Other things we could say that are practical and wise, think about the fact that God may be trying to teach you something through this. He may be trying to teach you through this difficult season of your life. You might have a boss who, who has put you into the cold, who's put you in isolation and obscurity, you are never, ever brought forward. You're never promoted. You, you, you feel obscured in your workplace. Trust me, God in his wisdom may be teaching you patience. There may be lessons of patience and perseverance that God is wisely taking time to teach you. And discern, all right? What do I mean by discern? I mean, trustingly, Learn what God is trying to do in your life. Is he teaching you patience? Is he just teaching you to work hard? We sometimes Christians, we don't realize this. <laughs> the problem we have with our boss may be just because we haven't realized. We're meant to work. You're actually meant to do a good job. Oh, my boss is rubbish. Oh, my boss tells me what to do all the time. Of course he does. He's, employed, he's paying you a check every month. He's allowed to. That's, that's kind of normal. That's common sense. Wake up. You're supposed to work. That's, that's in the Bible. 
Right? Work is, is a major part of what it means to glorify God. We glorify him by working, by learning to work. And sometimes, I tell you what, spiritual people can really miss this. People even from nice Christian backgrounds can miss this. I, I think I miss this. I come from a lovely Christian family, <laughs> as lovely as they can be. And, and yet, man, I miss this so bad. I didn't realize that, you know, following Jesus affects the workplace. A great preacher called Spurgeon said to a, uh, a young cleaning maid in his church who became a Christian, he said to her, what, what difference has being, being a Christian made to the way you do your cleaning every week? She said, well, now I sweep under the mats as well as around them. It's great, simple as that. That's what, that's what Christians do, they sweep under the mats, not just around them. They work harder than the others. They put in more time. They, because why? Because the workplace is a worship place. The workplace is an altar. It's a sanctuary. It's a, it's a glory to God place. It's an opportunity to lift up worship to him. Even when no one's watching and no one's thanking and no one's paying you bonuses. It's good to honor God. And, I, and we just miss, I mean, I tell you, when I was about 13, 14, I had paper rounds. I got sacked from a paper round and I was really annoyed. I said to my mum, I got sacked. I did, oh, 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 my, the news agent told me to go home. Told me not, I didn't tell me not to come in. Go, oh, you sacked me. Who do you think he is? You know, classic you know, teenager. Massive persecution syndrome. Who do you think he is sacking me? Mum said, of course he sacked you. You were rubbish. <laughs> you, you didn't turn up on time. Sometimes you didn't turn up at all. You put the papers in the wrong doors. You were rubbish at it. And that is the wrong thing to say to a 13-year-old. How dare you say that to me? You just don't understand me and my troubles. You know, teenagers, whatever. You know, we, <laughs> we, have, we are so pampered. We're so, we're so kid gloves. We're so, it's, we, we are so surrounded with cotton wool from childhood onwards. Christian kids, non-Christian kids, whatever. Kids from, I mean, I'm just so used to seeing it and the way even my kids, what, what, they, what they can expect from people around just oh you're you're such a lovely sunbeam wait a minute wait a minute this is a kid that needs to learn to work as well there's going to be a stage of life where they need to get a job there's going to be a stage of life where they're going to have the rude awakening of oh oh, oh, nine to five really means that and sometimes more work actually does need to be done there's something to be achieved here there's tasks to be accomplished to glorify god and the stuff i wouldn't learn when my mum was trying to tell me i had to learn later it was really embarrassing I had to learn after I, you know, when I was a student, an undergraduate, but, you know, when I started doing teacher training, it was like, oh my goodness, this is hard work. Yeah, it is. Welcome to the real world. Welcome to everybody else's life. It's, it's work. It's hard. And Christians need to be able to suck that up. So, okay, okay, okay. I can glorify God here. I can serve him faithfully, even in this context. That's just the reality of life. God might be teaching us just the simple, practical reality of work. It's a big deal for our generation. You know, 43% of people admit to pulling sickies in secret polls, secret surveys that are done. Pulling false sickies, I mean. Do you know that when you, when you, you check that figure against the 16 to 25-year-old generation, it goes up to 65%. Okay, so the younger generation massively, massively seem work shy. Massively looking for options out. This is huge for us. We need to come to terms with the reality of it. God may be trying to teach you loyalty, loyalty to an employer. God may be trying to teach you to learn how to listen to an employer. See, you think you work by punching in and punching out. That's not the work, all right? Occupying space in the office is not work. Actually, sometimes the best thing you can do for an employer is, is try and suss out what's in his or her mind. You know what it says in the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 20. It says this, The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water. Your, your employer has got dreams and visions for what they would... I mean, you might think, oh, he's hardly a visionary, my employer... Just trust me on this. There'll be things they would like to do and no one's ever listened to them. That may be the problem. It may be that the issue is that the difficulty you have is that you as a Christian, you never thought, wait a minute, 
how can I make their life better? How can I pray for them? How can I serve them? How can I tease out what is it that you want to do? Not just how can I use you and get my pay at the end of the month. How can I help you achieve the thing you want? Thinking about it, listening, trying to discern. It's amazing when you work with people who listen to each other, who work carefully to understand what's the vision behind the leadership here? What do they want to achieve here? How can we make it happen? And people who do that well, well, the Bible says people who are skilled will sit before kings. People who do good work, people who do skillful work, God will raise you up. I promise you, the more you continue to serve well, even when you are (laughs) ignored, even through seasons of isolation and just feeling completely frozen out, continuing, persisting, ultimately people will recognize the gift. People will start to raise you up. People will say, okay, this is someone we can trust in. God may be wanting to teach you major lessons about winning hearts through servanthood. God may be wanting to teach you to confront things. Maybe that your boss is basically someone that needs to be confronted. There's stuff going on that's just wrong. And what everyone else is doing is just sitting on it, muttering, mumbling, gossiping. That's how they deal with it. They gossip to one another. They don't speak to the boss. They don't speak to the boss. God may be saying to you, okay, one of the parts of your life that I want to strengthen now is for you to learn to confront, for you to go to your master and say, okay, I'd like to deal with this. I, I, can we talk? To find time to do it well, to not do it stupidly and flippantly. You know, the Bible says if you get involved in a quarrel that isn't yours, it's like seizing a dog by the ears. You don't have to be flippant. You don't have to be stupid. You don't have to go into some major tirade. But winsomely, wisely, graciously seeking them out. I remember when I was a teacher, just, just a certain way that my year, had, year head had with me and my class. And the way she spoke, sometimes in front of the pupils, I thought it was daft. I thought she was making major mistakes of judgment. She was making herself look stupid. She was making me look stupid. She was making the class look patronized. Oh, this is bad. And I kind of got annoyed with it. I got irritated by it. I carried around for months this sense of irritation. Eventually I realized, what the heck am I doing? I'm just grumbling about it. I could go and talk to her and solve it. But yeah, that'd be a bit awkward, wouldn't it? And she might be, she's my boss. She might, she might hate me for it. She could make my life difficult. And I realized this is just part of growing up. I've got to just do it. So I went to see her. I sat down. I talked with her. She, she, was, she was stunned. No one had done this before. All we, the whole atmosphere of the workplace was gossip behind people's back instead of to the face, instead of simple, clear confrontation in, in a gracious way. And sometimes you, can, you could be sitting on a win-win situation. You don't realize what you could win. Something, you could change something. You could actually help by confronting someone in authority. You could actually win the, the, the respect and approval and response and warm appreciation of a whole load of people. That, oh, at last, someone's spoken. Oh, man, what is it about? You may find that actually this gives you opportunities to share the gospel. Because, well, you did the simple thing of going to speak to the right person instead of simply gossiping. It's just kind of obvious stuff, but we miss it, don't we? Do it wisely. Do it well. And don't, don't be religious. If you're being pushed, for example, into things that go against your conscience, as I said earlier, you don't have to suddenly resist in some kind of stupid confrontational way. You don't have to say, well, that's against my principles. How dare you? I should be writing the Daily Mail about this. You don't have to do that. You can find ways, especially in the early stages, of being winsome. I love the story of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel is taken from his country into Babylon, into this sick, sinful city. And everything about his life changes. I haven't got time to go into the detail. But they ask him to do something that's against his conscience, which is eat meat that's been sacrificed to false gods. And he's like, I, just, I can't do that. It's not, that doesn't go down well. I'm not going to do that. But the way he does it is fascinating. He goes to his boss. You can read about it, early chapters of Daniel. And he says, give us 10 days of just eating veg. If at the end of those 10 days, we look skinny, and because they, they, they were like servants of the king, they were senior guys, Daniel wasn't allowed to get skinnier and skinnier. He needed to be a court, you know, he wouldn't have done, looked good for his employer if Daniel had come to work looking scraggy. His employer would have probably had his head chopped off. 
So he needed all his young men, all his young kind of servants to come through looking healthy and fit. He says, okay, give us just 10 days of vegetables instead of this meat, and, and then we'll talk about it after 10 days. And so the guy says, yeah, okay, 10 days, that's not going to hurt. That's the test we can do. After 10 days, Daniel and his friends who were just living on vegetables, they looked healthier, fitter, and fatter, frankly, than all the guys who were eating the meat. What had Daniel done? He'd found a way, he negotiated, he'd wisely discerned, how can I win this? It's good to do that. Learn your way. It's not wrong to negotiate wisely, to look for win-wins in your workplace, even with those who are difficult, even those who might be trying to push you against your conscience. Find ways to show a better way. And there are other times when you simply have to say, no, I cannot do what you're asking me to do. Even if I lose my job, fine. And that's the thing I should end on, really. Because frankly, if Jesus is your boss and your boss is not your ultimate boss, there are all kinds of implications. I've gone through several of them already, but the biggest and perhaps the most encouraging is that you have a boss, therefore, a heavenly boss, who you don't have to keep desperately trying to please. You, you please Jesus already because of his grace he, he accepts you and receives you kindly he forgives you your sins if you come to him if you've come to him maybe you haven't yet maybe you're not already a christian but if you know jesus christ if you're already in his family if you've been accepted into his into this relationship with him if if your sins your shame your guilt the things that block you from god your rebellion against God if that has been dealt with through the death and resurrection of Jesus well the boss is already really pleased God is really pleased with you in fact you can't displease him ultimately not ultimately ultimately he will always be for you he'll be happy with you you can be confident that he's pleased why because well Jesus is perfect and you're hidden in Jesus and the Father looks on Jesus and sees perfection. You're accepted, you're loved by God. And when you have that sense of security and safety, it frees you up from trying to find the security and the safety from, from other masters, worldly masters. See, ultimately, you can't really serve people until you're free from them. If you're desperately trying, desperately, the most important thing in your life is to win somebody else's approval, you will never win it. The only thing you need to worry about is God's approval. If you have God's approval through Jesus Christ, you can happily serve other people out of love, not out of desperate neediness. <laughs> How many of you know those people that try desperately in a needy way to please their bosses are the least pleasing people of all. Those desperately needy ones in the office. Bosses aren't pleasing. It's awkward. It's off-putting. But people who are free, free before God, to love, to follow, to say no sometimes, even to disagree and confront out of a spirit of love and gentleness. Wow, what can God do through such people? But you need first to come to Jesus Christ, the ultimate boss, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He accepts me freely. He loves me. He treats me gently and mercifully. And if you're thinking, how do I find the faith to trust that God is in control of my life, even of my work life? Where do I find the faith? You find it at the cross. You find it at the communion table. You find it when you come to the body and blood of Jesus. Because in the cross, we see a God who is so awesomely committed to loving us in spite of everything we've done. We could not be more secure. And because of that security, we're free. Free from the need, the dependence on bosses and managers, success in the workplace. We're free. We're already successes because of Jesus. 